the family. We say welcome to the family. to welcome each one this morning. God bless each one that has joined us for our weekly worship hour of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we always look forward to this time that we spend together each week in the worship of the Lord. Your faithful presence here in this assembly and those who join us later by the way of television and internet is such a blessing to our church, and we thank you for joining with us today. For the call to worship this morning, we please, please join with us in singing a hymn of testimony that's entitled, Love Lifted Me, hymn number 335. Love Lifted Me. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me now safe. Oh 
I've a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land and I long to be by my Savior's side just
done for me, I know. I'm unworthy of them all. But His blessings He freely gives, I owe my life to Him. I've got so much to thank Him for. And I've got so much to thank Him for, so much to praise Him for, you see. He's been so good to me. And when I think of all He's done and where He's brought me from, I've got so much to thank Him for. And sometimes while on my way, I need I stop and say thank you for all you've done for me. And one day I'll reach sweet heaven's shore. Oh, please let me kneel once more. I've got so much to thank him for. And I've got so much to thank him for, so much to praise him for, you see. He's been so good to me. And when I think of all he's done and where he's brought me from, I've got so much to thank him for. I think of all he's done and where he's brought me from. I've got so much to thank him for. John chapter 11. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was dead. Therefore his sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he saith to his disciples, Let's go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And the good thou goest there hither again. And Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in a day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth not the light, because he seeth the light of, the wor of this world. But if any man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is light, no light in him. These things he said, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleepeth, he doeth well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Look in verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha and, his, and the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said not I unto thee, that if thou believest, thou shouldst see, should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of these people which stand by, I said it 
that they may believe that, that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose them, loose him, and let him go. And many of the Jews which came to, to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did, believed on him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we have had the privilege already to be in your house. That we've had the privilege to hear singing and praising and to give you honor and glory. It's rare these days that churches have this type of blessings from God. But Father, Lord, may our people always lift their voices in praise and hands in praise and give you glory and honor. Now, Father, Lord, we look into the Word of God today. I ask for the leadership and guidance of Holy Spirit. May I say those things which are necessary, nothing more, nothing less. And when the work of Holy Spirit is done, may I quit. And you do the rest in the service. Now, Father, Lord, lead us, guide us. May souls be saved. May Christians be exalted. May the church move forward. In Christ's name, amen. Verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, his sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. As we look at the writing of Apostle John, the story of Lazarus is one of the most interesting of all the stories, all the miracles that I've read, because it talks about me, it talks about you. You see, this is the seventh miracle of many that John places in his writings. And probably one of the most pro pronounced and most important miracles that Christ done. You see, Christ had raised the dead. He had met them carrying his people, carrying people on, on the deathbed, and he had raised the dead. But this was an unusual resurrection. Why? Because Lazarus has been dead four days. Four days, buried in a, in a tomb, sealed with a stone. A couple of significant things. The Jews believed that for three days after death that the soul remained with the body. So this was a great example to the Jews that God had great power over death when the soul has departed. Something else. Four days, the body had begun to decay. Rot or rigor mortis has already been set in to the body. Seemed like it would be almost impossible to raise one of this nature. As we looked at Lazarus, the Hebrew form of the word Lazarus or the name Lazarus is Eliezer. That meaning to that name is God is my helper. God my helper. Surely this is a very fitting name for one who was so mightily helped by God. I told you just a minute ago that I like this because it talks about me. Today I'm a Lazarus. If you've been resurrected by the power of God, you're a Lazarus. You see, the story of Lazarus in a spiritual sense is the history of you and I who have passed from death into resurrection life. It's also the story of all those that are yet to be touched and healed by Christ. And those many of people who are dead and stinking in sin that need to meet the resurrection power of God. Let's look this morning at the story of a resurrection life. For us to look at the rest story of his life, first of all, we need to see his sickness. We need to look at the sickness that brings death. Look with me in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick. As John writes this, he begins, before he ever names the name of Lazarus, he says a certain man was sick, and then he gives the name Lazarus. Most of the time when you find this phrase or something of this nature in the Word of God, a certain man or a certain person is talking, it's used in the sense of being an example of all people of all people. 
This is the case here because all men are sick in sin. All men are sin sick. Everyone that's ever been born on the top side of this earth was sin sick. Matter of fact, let me even go back further than that. Everyone that has ever been created, including Adam, became sin sick. Adam wasn't born. He was a creation of God, but yet he turned his back, his mind, and his heart from God and served sin. You might say, Pastor, then that name Lazarus is so important. And I could claim that name Lazarus if I'm saved because my helper is God. My redeemer is Christ. You see, all people are sin, sick in sin. You might be here this morning and you say, I lived a pretty good life and I've never cussed and smoked and drank and I've never run with the wild crowd and I've never done this or I've never done that. The Bible is still true when it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. For all have come sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody, let's just, might as well just swallow your pride and get it out of the way and quit being so self-righteous and admit if I'm outside of Christ, I'm a sinner. And if I am Christ, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sickness of sin brings death. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes when we look at death. Not only do we see his sickness and him being dead and buried, but we find a great expression, a great example in this story of God's love for you and I. You see, look with me in verse 3. The message came to Christ concerning Lazarus, and he says this, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Lazarus. The, sister, the brother of Mary and Martha. The brother of the one who toiled in the kitchen and the one who came and washed his feet and anointed them with oil. Lazarus, the one who Christ loved, was sick. But wait a minute. Aren't you glad to know one other thing? Christ loves all those who are sick in sin. Christ loves every man, woman, boy, and girl. Be you white, black, red, yellow, pink, purple, polka dotted, it doesn't matter. Be you rich, poor, be you educated, uneducated, from the good side of the track or the bad side of the track, from the mansion on the hill to the cardboard box by the, river, by the railroad or riverside. It doesn't matter. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, loves all those who are sick in sin. Listen to this description of this love as recorded in Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us, in his, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hallelujah. Amen. One like me and one like you and somebody like all of us who were laden in sin and in iniquity and filth and corruption and on our way to hell, deservingly right so, didn't love God, didn't care for Him, had no thought of Him. But Jesus loved us and came from, from heaven, died on an old rugged cross, shed His precious blood, that He might, might through His blood redeem us from our sins and wash us from our iniquities and set us clean and free in Christ Jesus. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12 says that when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but them that are sick. How much does God love you and I? How much did Christ love us? He came to the cross and died for us, but the Father loved us so much that it says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My name is whosoever. Oh, my name is Lazarus and I'm one of those whosoevers. Why? Because I deserved it? No. 
Because I look so good? No. My wife might think so. I think she does. I think you do. But no, it's not any of that. It's simply because God so loved the world, mankind, every person, not just an elect few, not just this one and not that one, not just Bobby and not, and, and not Johnny, not just Linda and not Sue. No, he loved everybody for whosoever believeth in Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary. He came and he died for you in your sickness of sin. Look in verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, and the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus is saying to them that, he was saying to his followers, his disciples, that the sickness that caused Lazarus to die did not mean that Lazarus was dead forever, but that he could be raised from his dead state. Why? Because he was a believer in Christ. This, same message, this, same, this is the same message that the Word of God says about the sickness of sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 20, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But I want to give you good news this morning. You don't have to stay dead. Amen. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I knew not, cared not, and wanted not God, but God cared for and wanted me. Amen. And he wants you. You may be sitting in here this morning and you, you've been sitting in a church for 35, 40, 50 years, whatever. But if you don't know that you've been raised from the dead and you're not enjoying resurrection life in its fullest, you might not have never met Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, resurrection life. Jesus also said that when Lazarus was, dead, was raised from the deadness, of, uh, of himself or the state of deadness that the same thing would be happening to all those who was raised from the deadness of sin. Listen to this. Jesus said that his death was to bring glory and honor to the Savior when he rose again. May I tell you this morning without any hesitation, without any doubt, that when one who is dead in trespasses and sins meets the resurrection life, meets the Redeemer, meets Jesus, his sickness of sin is not to death, but that he would give glory and honor and praise to God and glorify the Son. When one is raised from the deadness of sin, listen to this, they will, they will, not maybe, not if, but they will bring glory and honor to God the Father and God the Son. Case closed. If you have a problem of praising Jesus, he might not be your Savior. If you have a problem of giving him glory and honor in your life every day and in the house of, the God, in the house of God, he might not have raised you from the dead yet. But Christian, believer... We should be glad that we're not sin sick anymore. We should be glad that we're not laying in the deadness of our sin and the filth of our iniquity in our own corruption. But that we have life, resurrected life in Jesus Christ. If Christ has given you resurrection life, why don't you give him praise and glory in his house? We've looked at the sickness. Now let's look at the death. Look in verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus plainly said and meant that Lazarus was totally dead. No heartbeat. No breath. Nothing. No blood flowing in his veins. He was dead. And that he would stay dead until he met 
the one who gives resurrection life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was about to meet the resurrecting power of God. Listen, death caused by sin is real death, total death, eternal death. Just quoted, let me quote again, for the wages of sin is death. Think about it. Let it burn into your heart. Let it burn into your mind. Let it burn into your soul. It's death. There's no godly heartbeat. There's no clean blood. There's no resurrected living. Romans chapter 7 and verse 11, For sin taken by occasion of this, by, taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by that it slew me. Sin kills. James says in James 1.15, And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Death. Spiritual death. Dead to God. Dead to the things of God. Not only that, death, un unconfessed and unforgiven sin can bring forth physical death. It can bring death to homes, to businesses, to communities, to churches. But listen, you don't have to stay dead. We find in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And you who hath he, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Listen, listen to this again. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. May I tell you what that means? It means he, and you who've been made alive, been raised from your dead state of sin. You who were dead in sin, now is alive unto God. Because he hath quickened you. He hath raised you up. He's given you resurrection life. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins. I love that. Even when we were were, were dead in sins. Has he come to us? Has he given us resurrection life? Has he quickened us? But just like Lazarus, all of us who were dead in sin comes forth into a new life when meeting Christ, the resurrecting power of God. Christians, we should be glad that we're no longer living in the deadness of sin, but now we live a resurrected life in the power of God for his glory, for his honor, give him praise and glory if you're not dead today, but made, made alive, been quickened by the Holy Spirit. We find that sin brings sickness, and sickness of sin brings death. But we also find that when one who's dead meets, meets the one who is the giver of life, things change. We have resurrection life. In verse 44, and he that was dead came forth. There on that mountainside, in that side of that mountain, they had hewed out a burial place, a tomb. They wrapped Lazarus with death clothes, burial clothes. They covered his face with a napkin. He couldn't see. He was mummified. They took him in and laid him on a stone probably, just a rock bed. Left him there, done some spices and some anointing and just maybe to kill the smell of deadness that would come out of that mountainside. They rolled a stone over that opening so nobody could go in and the animals could not get in and devour his flesh. Boy, think about that. Holy Spirit, thank you. Think about that. The things that would devour the flesh that you and I had as sinners. The animals of sin that would eat upon us in our deadness. But out on that mountainside, our loving Savior stood there by his weeping sisters. He said, God, I, Father, I, I'm glad you hear me. And I want them, these people to have no doubt in their mind that you sent me to be the resurrector of life. And he said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And guess what happened? 
Lazarus came forth. Do you remember when the Holy Spirit got a hold of your heart and your deadness? When the Word of God penetrated that old hard shell of yours? And Holy Spirit took that word and began to work into, the, into your body, through the, into your soul, through the preaching of the gospel. And it began to arrest you and tell you who Jesus was and show you his greatness and his power. And show you in your need and your sinful condition and how weak and, and, and hopeless and helpless you were. And all of a sudden Jesus said, Stanley, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Whosoever, come forth. I want to tell you what the devil of, and, and all the hounds of hell and the demonic powers of, of Satan could not hold back a child of God when they said yes to Jesus. They come forth believing in what he had done for them, giving praise and glory in his house. When the call of Christ comes by the word of God, to an old dead sinner in his putrefying condition and saying, I loved you, I died for you, I want to redeem you, I want to wash you, I want to clean you up, I want to take you to heaven. I tell you what, none of the powers of darkness, none of the powers of hell, Satan himself cannot hold you back because you have been born from above. Listen to this, Romans 10, 14. How shall they call on him whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe on him who they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I want to tell you what the calling of God on this whole pastor's life is to tell you that Jesus loves you. To preach to you how wicked and how corrupt you are in your own self and how sorry you are for following, Jesus, following Satan, but how wonderful it is that Jesus came and will rescue you from yourself and from your sin and from Satan and give you new life. I'm going to tell you I'm not apologizing for preaching the Word of God, the whole counsel of the Word of God, because you and everybody else needs it. Amen. And nobody's going to hear it unless somebody preaches it. Peter says, being born again, being born from above not of corruptible seed, of the incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I want to tell you what, there's something special about this book right here. It's the word of God. It's the incarnated Jesus on the pages that we read. I want to tell you, if you're going to get to heaven, you're going to go this way. If you're going to get saved, you're going to get born again by the word of God. Don't be ashamed of it. Be proud of it. Give him praise and glory because he gave us his word. Hold it high and hold it proud because I'm alive by the word of God this morning. I'm alive because some old preacher decided that they was going to follow God and preach the word of God. The whole counsel of the word of God, not compromise, not let down on the standards of the word of God, but preach sin is sin and uh, sin is black and hell is hot and eternity is long without Jesus. And I saw my need for a Savior because of my sinful condition by the Word of God. And by the way, it never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it'll never change. It's the perfect, infallible, pure Word of God by which men get saved. And if you don't get saved this, by, this way, by the Word of God, you're going to spend eternity in hell. The incorruptible seed. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life, resurrected life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But I'm so glad that when he came to me in my deadness of sin, that sin had done its work in my life and slew me. He loved me. Oh, he loved me. He knew me, yet he loved me. He knew me, but yet on the cross I was on his mind. He came, not that I could just go to heaven. But Jesus said in John 10, 10, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy, but I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I'm going to tell you what. If you've got life, you're going to live like you've got life. You're going to walk like, talk like, act like, smell like, and look like you've got life. And it's not just going to be in the house of God. It's going to be every day of the week because I'm going to tell you, people can't help but to notice that you have resurrection life because Jesus Christ is alive in you. Holy Spirit is dwelling in your body and you live that resurrected life seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Paul said this way, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. 
Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You say, preacher, how can you preach that way? Because Jesus is living here. You say, preacher, how do you know what's going on? Because Jesus is living here. How do I know that I've been raised from the dead? Because Jesus raised from the dead. How do I know that I have life eternal? Because Christ is eternal. How do I know that I have life and have it more abundantly? Because he's the one that gave it to me. Well, glory. And I live not in my own power, not in my own strength, but I live because the liver and the giver of resurrected life lives in me. Christians, we should be glad and rejoicing that where there is resurrection life in Jesus Christ, there is no death in sin. There is no eternal death for the believer. Give him praise and glory in his house. And when I was dead in sin, I was just like Lazarus. Just like this. There was a napkin over my face called being blinded by Satan. Satan had blinded my eyes. He'd covered me with the things of this world. I had no power because I was being led around by satanic power. But I want you to know that when Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth. And when he came forth, he had liberty to live. I want to tell you this morning that there is liberty in living a resurrected life. And when he was dead, came forth bound by hand and foot, and the grave clothes and, was, and upon his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. You see, Lazarus had been sick. Lazarus died and been dead four days. Lazarus heard the words of Christ. Lazarus came forth from the deadness of his sin. I want to tell you what a great miracle it was. I want to tell you what a great miracle it was when Lazarus was raised after being dead four days. But I want to tell you a greater miracle than that. I had been dead in trespasses and sin for many, many years, caring not that I could ever have life, didn't even want life, but Jesus Christ stood out in the, in the, in the history of my life, in the space of my time, and said, Stanley, I want you. I died on the cross of Calvary for you. Come forth! And I want to tell you what, when God calls your name, you're going to come forth. He looked in verse 39. Jesus says, take away the stone. I'm so glad. Amen. You know, churches are not in the business they ought to be in. Most churches today are not in the business they ought to be in. We're in the taking away the stone business. We're in the opening up the graves of the dead business. You say, can you raise the dead? No, but I know one that can. But we need to be busy taking away the stones. You see, there's too many things that blocking lost people who are dead in their sins from coming to Jesus. And namely, it's because the church is not doing what the church ought to be doing. We need to be busy giving forth the Word of God. And when the Word of God penetrates a grave, the stones will roll away. And they took away the stones from where the dead laid. Mary, bless her heart. She looked over at Jesus. And she says, Jesus, I don't know about this. You see, Lazarus has been four, dead four days and he's stinking. He's rottening. Well, I'd been dead for many years and I was a stinker and I was rottening. And it's time to turn the stinker loose and let him go. That's what the Word of God says. You see, too many people in the church today have this same thought about stinking sinners. Oh, we don't want those old bunch of people in this church. We don't want those nasty people in this church. We don't want those people that cuss like a sailor in this church. We don't want them that drink and, and drug. We don't want them that are harlots and whoremongers. We don't want those old sinners. I want to tell you what. If there's a sinner that's laying in the grave of sin, let's go roll away the stone and let's get them into the house of God where they can hear the word of God be born from above. I'm going to tell you what, I've never seen a sinner to come to Jesus that stunk. I've seen a lot of stinking Baptists, by the way, that look down their old pious religious nose and say, I don't want to go there and visit that bunch of people. You know, they're not of the same color we are. They're not of the same class we are. 
I want to tell you there's something wrong with them. They need to meet Jesus and be resurrected. I've never met a stinking sinner. Why? Because when a sinner comes to Jesus, he's changed. He's washed. He's clean. And when Lazarus came out of the grave, he didn't stink. And when sinners come into these doors who are dead in trespasses and sin, and the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the Word of God, get a hold of their heart, and the blood begins to be applied to that life, and the water of the washing of the Word brings new regeneration of that person's life, they don't stink anymore. Some of the sweetest smelling people I've ever met in my life is old stinking sinners saved by grace. Smelling good for Jesus. And by the way, just in case you become one of these people, you're looking down your old nose of pious religious attitude. The Word of God in Second Corinthians and First Corinthians chapter six lists about twenty-five sins. And he says this about it, and such were some of you. Not maybe you were. But ye are washed. Ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of his God. Aren't you glad that you have liberty in Jesus Christ? You see, the job of Christians in the church today is to remove stones and all those things that have sinners bound. Christ says, loose him and let him go. What a shame it would have been if his friends had just stood there instead of go and take the wrappings off of his life. I want to tell you what, there's a lot of people that need to be loosed and set free in Jesus. That's what the business of this church needs to be. Discipleship, training them, teaching them about the liberties and the freedoms that we have in Christ Jesus. No longer bound in the bondage of sin. No longer controlled by satanic powers, but have liberty in Christ Jesus because we have resurrected life. He tells us that we need to go teaching them all things concerning the kingdom. That we need to commit to faithful men the same things that we were taught. That we, were, that we were instructed in. Our job is to go open the graves, win the lost, see them have resurrected life, and teach them that they might go do the same. If, you have, if that's happened in your life, give Christ praise and honor and glory for the honor of teaching and discipling others. Give Him praise. What a life. What a life of resurrection. I'm going to mention just a few things. I'm going to hurry because we've got communion, but I want to just give you something else. In chapter 12, we find sweet communion with Christ in his new resurrection life. We find in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 12, and, and then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, was raised, uh, whom he raised from the dead. And they made a supper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. I'm so glad that we have the blessed privilege, as Lazarus did. Those who we were dead in trespasses and sin in the graves of this world, we have been transformed, we've been made anew, we've been made new creations in Christ Jesus. And we have the privilege, the distinct privilege of sitting in heavenly places with Jesus Christ today. Amen. Amen. What a freedom. What a fellowship to draw nigh to him. Every time we study his word, every time we pray, every time we join in teaching and preaching, every time we come together for praise and worship, every time that we meet together in his name to show forth his resurrection life, we sit having communion with Jesus Christ at the table of the word of God. If you enjoy it, give him praise and glory. Amen. And in chapter 12, we find also that there's a testimony of the new life. Because we find in chapter 12, because of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus and because of the new life that he had in Christ Jesus, many believed on Christ, verse 11 of chapter 12. But then there's some suffering in our resurrection life. Just a little bit. You see, people saw such a change in Lazarus' life in chapter 12 and verse 10, they consulted to put him to death. But I want to tell you this. No harm, no hurt can come to those who are protected by the Holy Spirit having been born again by the Word of God. What a wonderful life, resurrection life. It's a Bible truth that sin is sickness. It's a Bible truth that sin causes death. It's a Bible truth that all who are living in sin are dead to God. It's a Bible truth that Christ died for sinners. 
It's a Bible truth that Christ saves and gives liberty and life to all who believe. It's a Bible truth that those who believe can have and enjoy fellowship and sweet communion with Christ. What a life. I'm a Lazarus. God is my helper. You are Lazarus. God is your helper. What a wonderful life it is to not be in the deadness of sin, in the bondage bound by satanic powers but to be living a resurrected life because he loved us and gave himself for us at Calvary. Heads bowed and eyes closed as Jack and the ladies come. I want to give just a short one verse of invitation because we're going to have communion. One verse. But if God's touched your heart, you're not saved. You're still in the deadness of your sins. Come. Somebody take the word of God and show you how you can know beyond any doubt that Christ loved you and died for you. If you're here this morning and you haven't been living for him like you should, maybe you need to come. Ask him for resurrection power. Maybe you want to come and thank him. One verse and then communion. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching this morning, for giving forth the word of God. But thank you for giving us resurrection life in Christ Jesus. What a life. What a life. No deadness, no corruption, no filth, but just liberty and loving Christ. I pray, Lord, you'd work your, a miracle in the heart of every one of your people. If there's anyone here today that's lost, may they come. In Christ's name, amen.